How much bass could possibly come from something this small? Could this, for instance, replace the subwoofer in your car? Well, there's a new arrival in my makerspace, and I did kind of promise doing something cool with the other one of these speakers, so let's do something cool. Today's video begins in the garage as I make way for this 12 pound box, sitting on top of this 132 pound crate. And on the off chance that the name GVIC doesn't ring a bell, the majority of their 18 year operation has been in the industrial sector producing just about anything you'd otherwise find in Tony Stark's man cave. The GV Cloud family of lasers is the company's foray into the consumer market competing with the likes of Glowforge to deliver a powerful benchtop solution. This particular machine is fitted with an internally cooled 50 watt CO2 laser which, as it stands, has nearly 10 times the power of my diode driven unit, so if cutting through a quarter inch of plywood in 6 slow passes isn't your jam, consider the following. Your typical diode laser will operate somewhere just below the ultraviolet in the 450 nanometer range, which is best suited for engraving anodized metallic surfaces. A CO2 laser, on the other hand, operates at an infrared wavelength of 10,600 nanometers, more so along the absorption spectrum of textiles, polymers, ceramics, and natural materials like wood. In other words, it is good at vaporizing these things, which is, in fact, how we achieve a laser cut. So, that's this big bitch right here. And I'll scatter some more information about it further into the video. For now, let's have a look at the little guy. And to get this barely inch and a half piston down into the sub base without simultaneously reducing it to a one note wonder, I've gone the impedance matching route. If you recall what I did with the other one of these drivers last year, the strategy was to exert pneumatic impedance over the piston as a form of excursion control. This time I'm going to acoustically amplify the back wave, which for starters requires a lot more space and a lot more precision. As you can see here, even the slightest variation in the angle of the taper means a world of difference in the compression chamber, and the same holds true for the resulting performance. With the laser's 510 by 300 mm processing area doubling as the enclosure's footprint, I was able to fold a 1 and 1 half meter long expanding waveguide design to extend the driver's in-room performance just shy of 60 Hz. However, when I simulated this very same alignment, corner loaded in the back of my Chevy Sonic, well, let's just say that while I trust my software, I kinda like to hear this to believe it. And that's exactly the plan. Though before I show you what I have in mind, there's still more to unpack. Right away, several of the accessories arrived aboard the laser, as it were, and these include a 5 inch diameter nylon fabric air hose, a storage box full of bits and pieces, a 6 inch diameter air hose with some clamps and fittings, and a set of 3 cables, power, ethernet and USB. The other box was packed full of this inline duct fan for improved exhaust and a rotary attachment for processing cylindrical objects. Actually, make that two separate size rotary attachments, each with an interchangeable scissor lift. Here, GV could have obviously gone the cheap route just to list the feature, but it's precisely this level of accommodation that says these tools are for actually getting shit done. Lastly, at the very bottom of the crate, we find a stash of assorted laser-friendly materials. And here is my live-action take on the complete list of items included when you order the Pro. Needless to say, for a complete CO2 solution, this is not a lot of baggage. And I say complete, given that the water chiller and the air compressor is built right into the substantially heavy-duty metal case. Anyhow, for the sake of mobility, I modified my cart with a 98 by 57 centimeter bench top to match the machine's footprint and these little bumpers to protect the corners. There, now I can easily wheel this thing around the house. Which matters because if you're sharing your workspace with, let's say, a car, making efficient use of seemingly no space at all is just part of the adventure. Also, on the off chance that I prefer to laser from the comfort of my office, or in this case, simply get acquainted with the control software, well, that too is an option. Mind you, the wife acceptance factor that I'm working with here is well over 9,000. 9,000? There's no way that could be right! Next, let's talk about the fact that when cut, certain materials will produce hazardous fumes, and this is where the exhaust comes into play. The inline fan is mounted by the workbench, and since the included 6 inch diameter air hose is quite short, I've sprung for a length of this 4 layer premium stuff from AC Infinity. Also, here's a few brackets that I made for the occasion. Once in place, the hose travels from the fan, across the garage and out into the open. 
The reducer on the other side is fitted with the included 5 inch diameter hose, which in turn connects to the laser. So, anytime I want to use it, I just roll it out of the corner, hook up the exhaust, connect to a computer running light burn, and it just works. The machine's controller is recognized immediately without the need for any third party drivers or other mandatory software, which also means that I can get on with whatever it is I'm doing literally seconds after the hardware handshake. What's more, with the 5 megapixel camera built right into the lid, it's even more convenient to arrange toolpaths along the processing area. For acoustic builds, MDF tends to be my go-to material, so I'm very interested to see what it takes to cut through this quarter-inch sample. Here, I've prepared a test running the laser between 50 and 80% power, with travel speeds between 5 and 20 mm per second. The results are impressive to be sure. As you can see here, even at half power, the laser punches through in a single pass. Vincent! We happy? Yeah, we happy. Indeed, at a quarter inch or 6.35 millimeters per layer, I can achieve my target cross section in only 13 layers. And these acrylic samples from the included pack can become the outer walls for a see through aesthetic, with gaskets on either side to help seal the waveguide. Shall we begin? I already did, and for an even cleaner finish, I decided on two passes per cut. In fact, with a fully motorized laser head, I can automatically run the first pass drop the focal point, run the second pass, and still complete as many as three sheets per hour, making something like this actually doable as a weekend project. What's more, the machine has proven extremely reliable with unrelenting consistency from one toolpath to the next, further alluding to its industrial pedigree, and the fact that it doesn't even impinge on my limited work area speaks volumes for the overall form factor. Not to make a joke of it, but even the air exhaust doubles as a bumper for the car door. Anyhow, given the sheer speed at which the laser cut through all that MDF, I decided to double the fun and build a pair of these. So, for all intents and purposes, that's 19 centimeters of MDF and acrylic that I cut through in a span of a weekend. The last thing on the chopping block is a roll of this closed cell phone. Another polymer. And even at minimum power, everything is cut in just a few minutes. Needless to say, if you want perfect air seals to line your see-through panels or gaskets to go around the back of a driver, a CO2 laser like this one is the perfect tool for the job. Anyhow, let's get everything put together. And here, I'm using the same type of an alignment grid as I did for the tapped horn project a few months back this time with a total of 26 screws providing both the temporary clamping force and the alignment from one layer to the next. As you can see here, everything fit together perfectly, and with all the MDF pieces glued, the entire thing is coated with a few layers of sanding sealer. Ordinarily, this would also involve a bit of sanding, but for the purpose of this project, I'm only looking to encase the material in some polyurethane. Next, I'll want some binding posts around the back, and here's a little guide I made for the pilot holes. Once they're in, the cable is threaded through to the compression chamber, at which point it's onto the gaskets. Here, I could've obviously cut the foam into more manageable pieces, but this seemed like more fun. Mind you, not as much fun as peeling all this masking paper from the acrylic sheets, or attaching them with a total of 104 metal screws. Anyhow, let's see if it works. Yeah, that's good. So, now let's get the drivers in the right way around and get to some actual testing. Right away, here's the in-room frequency sweep. No major surprises there. In fact, the psychoacoustically smooth response correlates well into the upper mid-range. For the in-car stuff, I set up an MK300.2 from AudioDynamics, which, despite the miniature size, can still deliver nearly 400 watts of clean power into a 4-ohm load, but today we'll only need about 2% of it. Here's the sweep, and... Well, strictly speaking, 60 Hz is the threshold for sub-bass. Meanwhile, as predicted, this thing retains at least a modicum of presence down into the mid-50s. Needless to say, you'll want to get your listening gear on standby for a demo coming up here in just a moment. In the meantime, I have some final thoughts about the machine. Not the least of which is the sheer amusement at the fact that I can make stuff like this right from my garage just hanging out enjoying a rainy weekend. In fact, let me just press a few more buttons and there, an edge lit sign? Sure, why not? 
Evidently making stuff like this is a business in itself. And that's really the underlying sentiment. This machine means business. Its accessories mean business. The thing sets up in a matter of seconds, it doesn't require constant maintenance, it doesn't stop in the middle of a job, and most importantly, it doesn't cost me my time. Instead, it works beside me, tending to its assigned task. Really, the only thing that I could possibly gripe about are the USB Type-A ports along the back, requiring the use of a somewhat uncommon cable, especially if you need one longer than what's been provided. Other than that, the machine is solid, and big thanks to GVIC for sending it out. Now then, all that remains is the demo. And for the first portion, I will run the speakers full range in stereo. Then, once we get back into the car, I will set them up as a subwoofer with a passband of 40 to 80 Hz. So, go ahead and get yourself situated for a bit of listening, and as always, feel free to drop a comment about your choice of audio gear and your overall thoughts on the project. I'm also interested to know, what is the smallest, diameter-wise, speaker that you've ever been impressed with and under what circumstances? Finally, don't forget to rate the video as you see fit, subscribe if you're so inclined, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers! Nothing here. 